Okay, ma'am, please continue. Thank you, Janet. So, a very good morning to all of you. Here it is a new lecture. It is a pre bound lecture because of the non availability of the uh, past speaker. So, today we have with us uh, Ms. Fugia Tushki. Uh, she is currently working as a scientist in Agricultural Microbiology Division at ICR Central Institute of Post Harvest Engineering and Technology, CIFET Lunya. Her core area of research is development of agro industrial bioproducts. She has she has got one patent and given 14 license to five technology for commercialization. She has published more than 15 research papers, one book, five book chapters, and 10 extension literature and conducted nine training programs. She has also confirmed with Best Scientist Award, Young Scientist Award, Best Technology Award, Best Culture, and 12 Institutional Level Awards. So with these words, I invite Ms. Tupia Tushini for her presentation on Utilization of Agricultural Residue for Value Addition as Protein. Welcome, Surya Madam. Please hold on yeah thank you dr pragya first of all i would like to thank the organizers for inviting me as a speaker uh, in such a multidisciplinary gathering and uh, uh, as uh, dr pragya briefed that i am working basically on agricultural residues and their conversion into value added products so today i'm uh, i'm giving you an overall uh, uh, coverage about the agricultural re residues, how they are utilized at present, and what are the future perspectives, how we can use them for food purpose also. So one example we took here as a protein. So I hope all have joined. Shall I start? And my voice is audible? Yes, yes. You may continue. As we all know that uh, agriculture is the largest contributor to the economy, specifically in our country, in India. And uh, more than 60 to 65% population is still involved with the agriculture. And so uh, uh, when we say that we are largest producers in wheat, rice, second largest or third largest in many of the cereals and uh, to some extent pulses, then definitely we are the largest generators of the waste materials also. And we also called agriculture as a farming and this farming includes the cultivation of animals plants fungi and other form of life why because to get a food fiber fuel and different kind of drugs pharmaceutical products everything that is needed for a sustainable life for our life so our uh, uh, country is an agricultural country we all know and that's why uh, as i told that we are also the largest generator of this waste and in past years when uh, in 50s 60s even uh, up to 90s basically uh, the production was not that much high so uh, and residues are also being uh, either they are dumped or uh, either they been used as fuel at homes and likewise but as our population is increasing so parallelly we are also focusing on uh, production side also and with that production is also the generation of waste now what we, what uh, there are uh, what could be the end is it, uh, how we will manage such a huge quantity of waste because there is a there is a limit of its usage which i'll show you in uh, further slides that how it is being used and even after that how to deal with that waste what we are calling uh, where to dump otherwise uh, what the farmer are doing we all know uh, in, in the peak seasons they just after the harvesting of their crops they are just burning the uh, residual waste specifically for the rice crop in their field and it is generating everybody knows that in north india and in ncr region delhi and in and around there is a there is a huge uh, uh, the air the october november and december and there is there are so many breathing issues that has been raised if you see the data uh, because of such kind of po uh, pollution that is being created by these kind of residues and uh, as i told that uh, uh, we are the largest india is the richest country i could say in agricultural resources because of its weather conditions we are able to produce numerous 
uh, different varieties of crops that could be your cereals that could be your pulses that could be your vegetables uh, and uh, your your spices and different plantations crop everything in india uh, depending upon the type of uh, uh, weather conditions different states they are they 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 have an uh, edge in different kind of crops it could be uh, and because of that we are presently uh, almost uh, 350 million tons of organic waste that is being produced only from the agricultural sources and it includes according to the crop type the waste could be like the sugarcane bagasse it could be the uh, paddy husk and paddy uh, paddy straw wheat straw and uh, the vegetable all the waste that is being generated by peeling of vegetables and the utilization in food processing industry and uh, likewise the fibers shells and mill waste and husk and stalks these are few examples and uh, if if i give a brief about the what exactly the these agro industrial waste they uh, basically they are they, they are generated either from uh, either on field or either during the processing or during the milling or processing of that agricultural product at the industrial level from both the ends these kind of agro industrial waste they are generated and their generation is uh, maybe in some crops it is up to 10% in some crops it is the 20% of the production of that particular crop and what ultimately they are doing they are ultimately uh, giving a harm to our environment and what we are doing they are mostly untreated they are mostly we, i i could say nowadays they are underutilized because they have certain uh, value added things in tabbed in them but these are remain unexplored till uh, 2000 means uh, in our 90s but now in last uh, in last two decades uh, researchers are working on these waste Uh, for the uh, in la last one decade people are working uh, rigorously on production of biofuels and apart from biofuels now what next how further the, these could be used but that uh, should not be up to lab level it should be uh, it should be a thing this waste should be used as a value addition not only up to lab level but it should reach to the consumers we should we should use that waste in such a way that it should uh, bring out a certain uh, useful product that could come in market that people could use it so that was the ultimate aim uh when we when uh, we at cifet targeted the agro industrial waste that how better we can convert or we can extract the useful things out of this with an econo in economical value with a commercial value and with an acceptance among the consumers now uh, there if you can say the agricultural waste it basically comprised of three four things one is the animal waste that came from all different kind of the uh, uh, like the animal carcass and other things food processing waste for example uh, only the 20% of maize that is canned and 80% is waste when we are working on the maize for its scanning then uh, 20% is the main product and 80% is the waste so likewise different crops have different kind of processing waste uh, during their uh, uh, during their processing and other is the crop waste which is basically uh, either it generated on the field and sometimes during the primary milling of the different crops these are stalks bagasse drops like uh, sugarcane bagasse we can say in the sugar industries and uh, corn stalks on field itself because the corns are been plugged in field and other drops and culls vegetable and prunings and for example uh, if i talk about paddy when it is uh, for first of all uh, taken to the rice milling industry where the milling of rice is done to remove its husk then the husk comes uh, around 8% it is waste of the total production so and on, on uh, then after milling the in other steps its bran is also uh, removed to obtain that white rice what we usually uh, consume at our homes so that is around 10% so likewise different kind of uh, crops are there and at different steps uh, several different you can say waste or residues are generated and uh, uh, so if you can think that with a single crop at multiple steps multiple waste are generated and each have their own potential for its usage now till now till these slides i am uh, i am just uh, saying it as a waste but now people are calling it as a agro residues these are no more termed as a waste they are called as a agro residues why so i'll explain in further slides if you can uh, understand the concept of waste then through several research papers and through several uh, technical uh, articles you have uh, 
uh, must have heard the uh, terminologies like byproducts, co-products, secondary products, intermediate products, and sub-products. So there are so many term terminologies that are being used parallelly. But uh, if you uh, if we go by the European Union guidelines, then basically they say, uh, as per their waste law, it is very clear that material that is simply it is termed as waste or not. There is a difference between two. And for these reasons, they have used different kind of these terminologies to explain, to make a difference between a waste, between a byproduct, between a waste, between a co-product, between a secondary product, like likewise that. They have clear, uh, they have given a, uh, different definitions for each kind of things that for that particular thing, you have to use uh, this particular uh, uh, term. For example, again, I'm taking the example of rice. When the patty is milled in the industry, the Are first video one video is on. Please check. It is visible. Yes, yes. it is visible. Continue, ma'am. Okay. So as I told, now we first we need to understand is a basic difference between a waste, between a product and residue, between a byproduct. Waste is something which is which you which the person have to discard because. It, it ultimately don't have much uh, potential uh, for any kind of value addition, which could be economically viable, which could be sustainable, also from environment point of view, also from uh, from its production point of view, and that also has some end value. Now, other is a production residue. Production residue means a material which is which you have not uh, which is being produced during the processing of a particular crop that you don't want to produce but deliberately you have not produced it but it came during the processing during the further steps like i told you uh, that for example when we uh, when we do milling of rice then rice bran is the brown layer is to be removed to obtain the white rice so this brown uh, uh, layer which is removed it is known as rice bran so this is a production residue you don't want it but during the processing you need because people mostly like white rice in our country so that's why we can call this a production residue then the byproduct By, what is a byproduct a production residue that can be used directly or indirectly for further processing again i'm taking the example of rice bran rice bran which is a production residue in the rice milling industry when this rice bran because it have an oil content of more than 20%, when it goes to the oil industry, where now uh, you must have heard of the rice bran oil, in, which is in the market, and people are using it from the past. Uh, I think the hype basically is from the past seven, eight years, but although uh, it is in market from past 15 years. So when this rice bran, which is oil rich, it, it goes to the oil industry. In the oil industry, they extract the oil from this rice bran, and then they generate again a byproduct which is called as de-oiled rice bread because the oil is removed this way the conceptual framework is exactly and the waste is something that that exactly at the end you are saying that it is of no use we have to discard it or we have to decompose it uh, if it is decomposable now till date in the past Basically, how people are using the residues, uh, residues, it could be as animal feed, for example, straw, wheat straw, till date wheat straw is being used, composting for things where uh, they are not as such used for feed or like uh, vegetable peels and uh, all these things, they are being used as compost for energy production, uh, energy production like the corn cobs and uh, other uh, stalks and bagas, they are all used for energy production, biofuel production, as I told you biogas production that is being used in past in villages maybe uh, in some parts also maybe uh, still it's being used biochar production and for conservation agriculture these are the potential uses earlier we used to say that uh, being used if you talk about the crop residues and as i told you that tons beside these usage tons of the residue it is being burnt on farm and that is creating huge health issues uh, in the uh, of the uh, population of every age group whether it's a 5 year old kid or whether it's a 65 year old person now then uh, we thought that how this residues apart from their previous uh, previous use as a source of energy how better we can uh, we can bioconvert them so that safely it could be decomposed or safely it could be used so that uh, 
on one side uh, uh, it is environment friendly on the other side it uh, at least uh, you can control the pollution and on third side it is adding uh, the what we have taken from the soil we are giving back to soil that's it so bioconversion basically uh, it's a term where any kind of organic materials such as it could be a plant waste it could be an animal waste that can be converted into any kind of usable product or any kind of energy sources which i showed you in previous slides some usable products i'll be covering in uh, further slides or any kind of conversion from a uh, from a uh, this waste into a useful product by using the biological agents it could be certain microbes it could be certain enzymes means where you are using certain biological agents then this is called the bio conversion it's a way of converting that organic material into a useful thing by using certain microbes and it basically uh, uh, put a pressure why that we want to recover the product or it should be uh, the product should be re uh, the, it could leads to also the recycling the re reusage of resources and also the minimization of waste streams so basically bioconversions aims all these things and that's why we are converting the organic waste into the useful things by the microbes and biofuels is a very good example of it now then with time uh, earlier we are focusing on bioconversion then what then a term came with time as the pollution is increasing as the our air quality index is decreasing climate changes are there then a term came with time that is a sustainable bioconversion now bioconversion i told you sustainable means parallelly it should not generate any kind of uh, nuisance material or any kind of such things which are the waste which is generated from that bioconversion it should also be safe it should not be that it will further uh, create the problem once we have converted the organic material into a useful thing but again with generation of such kind of waste that itself is creating a problem so sustainability should be there in any kind of bioconversion and this bioconversion from lab to its commercial viability to consumers that ultimately is the goal now in this concept then we need to understand as we as i told you one example today we are taking is a protein so why uh, we are working in this area and uh, uh, why today i have took this example the thing is if you see the data which is given by the uh, our IM, uh, icmr delhi they say if you check they say more than 60 more than 80 percent of people they are protein uh, they have you, you can say either malnutrition either they have protein deficit and in these 80 percent mostly are the women's which are which are the sufferers due to this uh, uh, deficiency of protein in their body and that's why the problems which are uh, which they face in their late 50s now they are facing that problems due to protein deficiency in their 40s and even in their 30s and 20s but at the end when we say no, no we are taking a very healthy diet and if you see uh, in indian food mostly we are oriented towards the carbs followed by fats to some extent protein and fiber both are ignored even you can take a i can say a bowl of dal every day since it 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 hardly provides because protein should be as per your body weight and it should be uh, more than 50% at least you have to consume and from that bowl you hardly get 10% so if we think that adding that 10% every day you can imagine that how much carbs you are taking in uh, at 200 or 300% uh, including fats and how much deficit your body is in protein and what happens then slowly with age this your 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 bones and uh, your your whole structure you feel you started feeling lots of problem and that is all because of this deficiency of protein so why because our in our country the food habits are uh, like that parallel is secondly the sources uh, what we take it supply uh, the protein level uh, in the in that uh, particular product is also limited and there are few products which are protein rich but that is also there is an issue some people can eat some people cannot eat for example somebody wants to have like we eat soya bean every day but some people for example who have an issue of thyroid they can't consume soya so these proteins how we will uh, give this protein to each and every table 
we we can give it in form of supplements so that's why and uh, how the supplements everybody know when the word supplements and when the protein supplements come in market we only know two things one is the whey and second is the uh, protein uh, pow uh, powder protein which is in market from the whey milk but now today we will discuss there are many other plant based sources from where we get this protein now before going into the protein part there are few uh, uh, more things that have been done uh, in uh, past decades upon these residues means one is on their handling part and they are because they, we know that they are quite bulky and it's not easy to carry them from one to other place to longer distances so one is a biomass pelletization it's a very popular uh, 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 product which is being prepared from uh, from the residues and they the, the the bulky residues is converted into such kind of pallets it could be used as a fuel it could be used as a your uh, 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 feeding and everything these kind of pallets they are easy to storage easy to manage easy to carry and how this uh, how these pallets are being prepared they are being prepared from different kind of straws it could be any straw uh, there are small pellet mill at lab level and there are big plants which make these kind of pellets and that's the the they, uh, the good thing is that uh, their moisture content is low so they can be stored up to longer period and they can be used as and when required which is much better than storing a uh, this straw the the these i am discussing the uh, current uses in terms of its uh, uh, utilization uh, as a uh, uh, as a construction material or uh, as a feeding material or likewise so other is we have heard of fly ash brick this fly ash brick it is basically in market people are now using it for uh, for make in their houses it is available from two sources the major source is the coal ash from coal ash they are making but apart from that rice husk which is after burning it the ash which is left that are also being used for making these fly ash bricks they have they have equivalent strength and they could be used than the ordinary one and uh, another thing uh, if you have seen uh, like uh, in past two three years there is a huge uh, demand and the, the government is saying that we need they that there is a ban on single use plastic but on one hand we are banning the single use plastic but there should be a way out also that how what could be the alternatives so nowadays you are seeing different kind of uh, such kind of uh, disposable tableware materials they are available there are three there are hardly uh, which have a means which are commercially uh, making these things there are uh, four or five people four or five companies in india uh, one is in hyderabad one is in bangalore and we, which are making these kind of disposable table wares and some have a shelf life of up to seven months they could be reused and some of them are also used in the microwave so these uh, earlier we used to eat uh, food on the that we call patals but now they are being replaced by such kind of disposable table wares which 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 you can say they have a, a good shelf life and they they have a appealing look and they could be reused they could be also compatible with the uh, our uh, microwaves and everything and uh, otherwise uh, like we all know about the coolards traditionally they are being made by the directly from the mud but nowadays that mud is also very costly and the people they are people are mixing uh, if you feel uh, whatever the, the these kind of cups that they, they are available uh, they, they mix certain kind of uh, different materials to provide strength to replace mud but they are adding a very uh, uh, different taste to it but it could be also but these cups could be also be made by the adding the residues to it which on one side is also uh, strengthening the uh, giving the strength and also they are not uh, compromising on the taste of the liquid which is poured in it corn cobs have been used for making for as a incorporation to certain percentage along with the mud for making these kind of earthen cups and mushroom cultivation we all know for mushroom cultivation it's mushroom cultivation the different kind of uh, rice straw they are being used and uh, this is a commercial application that we all know how the mushroom is being cultivated and where the different kind of residues in mixture they are used for producing different kind of for different kind of uh, mushrooms <laughs>
and uh, so these are the certain uh, applications which after the usage of residues as an energy they is being shifted to the pelletizers one mushroom cultivation other fly ash bricks third or it could be the in form of cups fourth and there could be this is how this is a mushroom cultivation which is being done in punjab agriculture university it's a, a photo of their lab where uh, they commercially produce some mushroom and now again uh, what after these again we got stuck now we have there could be many more applications where physically we can use this residues for any kind of end product now when we say that we are deficit in protein when we say that we need food for the growing population then we need to think of this residues and their conversion as a uh, as a food material so this is i told you that uh, uh imr they are saying that more than 80 percent people they are deficit and if you see the unicef reports they say that more than 50 46 percent of preschool children and 30 percent of the adults these are they are they suffer from moderate to severe uh protein calorie deficit malnutrition it it, it appears to be like key uh, it couldn't be happen but but the actual facts are more than these and now the question comes from where we need where this kind of protein deficiency need to be fulfilled how it could be fulfilled then uh, i am sharing you first the global scenario how the different kind of uh, how they are uh, fulfilling their protein demand they are fulfilling their protein demand in form of the supplements and these supplements they have a huge production market in right from the you, uh, you can say the uh, north america it dominates in the production of protein supplements then they are marketed to the countries asian countries and other countries that's why the prices are very high here because we hardly have a uh, hardly have a uh, i can say an excel in this area of production of protein supplements so basically globally uh, north america it dominates followed by some other countries and they are uh, uh, hardly few like the europe somewhere to some extent and in asia pacific hardly one or two countries so this is a global protein uh, supplement market when we uh, talk about the proteins then in india the area is niche but now people are aware Pe people uh, people those who earlier went to the gyms they they were aware that, that there is there is a product called protein supplements and it is basically used in the bodybuilding they uh, the information is uh, uh, limited only to uh, this uh, protein supplementation for bodybuilding and only the person who went to the gym they have to take these kind of proteins but now people uh, and our consumers they are getting more and more aware in uh, last one decade and now they the question come in their market that why uh, market is so much flooded with these kind of protein supplements how these can could be used by a common person and when they have to use it then what to buy why to buy and how to use it different questions come in mark uh, in our mind so uh, for understanding for answering these questions first we need to understand the labeling of the labeling of these kind of products there if you notice any protein supplement you can google it you can check it on amazon you can check it on any kind of store then you can find a word the term protein isolate is written on on any uh, box and uh, protein isolate protein isolate the word isolate means that product have more than 90 percent of the protein in it it could be in form of powder it could be in form of any kind of product or anything means the product is more than 90 percent protein rich that's why the word isolate is used and it, it there are some more requirements usually these kind of isolates they doesn't have their own flavor they are uh, flavorless and uh, they they are also usually of blend creamish white color and because of their high protein concentration they could be further used in your diets in different forms and these isolates they have presently uh, they are being used as a meat analogs uh, 3d meat analogs are being prepared which give a look of meat and texture of meat but it it is a basically a vegetarian source where the protein isolates are being used uh, to mimic 
the look of a meat and they are also used as a texturized vegetable proteins you are vegetable supplements which are flooded with markets nowadays if you if you if you go to a uh, go to a very like these uh, uh, big uh, big bazaars and all these then you can find the bakery products even the papads they are being written with protein rich papad and or, or you can say the protein rich uh, cookies or protein rich uh, shakes like these why because now uh, uh, as the consumers are aware now the companies are are looking into the different aspects of how to use this protein and uh, which is earlier they are coming with only one product in market that is a supplement in form of powder you can mix it you can take it like that but when 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 you see that it's not easy every time you take a take out a spoon and consume it it should be handy also that for example you are going to office it should be in form of certain baked products that you can carry with you and you can have it any time during your day which could fulfill certain grams of your protein requirement of a day so the uh, this what i am uh, talking about that uh, dairy industry it is among the most important source for isolating these kind of protein isolates you must have seen such kind of uh, boxes in market now i have uh, con i have explained the term isolate isolate is when the your protein content is more than 90% there are a few terms also that you found on the in the labels that is a protein concentrate or the hydrolyzed protein in the third uh, box see the iso hydrolyzed so protein concentrate means when the protein content is less than 85% between 70 to 85% then we call is at a concentrate and hydrolyzed protein is when when the certain enzymes are added to it to make the complex protein into the simpler peptide form so that your body could easily digest it and uh, uh, these are the few terms which are written as per the particular uh, uh, box and accordingly the rates are decided that's why the isolates are costlier than the concentrates and as i told you the dairy industry again uh, we know that milk is basically made of two proteins that is the whey and casein and whey protein it is it can be separated from casein in the milk and formed you can say as a by product also it is generated in the cheese making and this by product this by product is being used for making these kind of protein isolates and in uh, from 70s to late uh, 90s the basic source of these protein isolates is from the whey now with time when the researchers are working on other parts also then we found that there are certain plants also which could provide a good protein uh, isolate or good protein concentrate and if you can uh, remember from these uh, boxes then you can easily recollect that in past 2 3 years there are few people who are advertising these pro products these are like ozevia uh, protein and herbs plant based proteins is fast of plant protein isolate and you can say in in every product they have written whether it is an isolate whether it, it is a concentrate or whether it is a hydrolysate and these products uh, with time they are came in market and from where they came how we are making them how uh, uh, what is their source uh, we'll just check in further slides but the uh, one plus point of replacing the whey based proteins by the plant based protein is that these plant based proteins have low calories and fat content because we all know that uh, the something which is coming from animal the fat content and calorie content is quite high so what the whey protein is having these plant based proteins their calories and in terms of fat they are on a lower side and they are rich in certain essential nutrients and rich in fiber dietary fiber what we all need for our body now uh, it it just uh, uh, for example uh, i have just showed that uh, how what kind of residues are being used for making these kind of plant proteins for example if you take example of sunflower and it this sunflower goes to oil industry there uh, what they do they uh, they dehull it and after dehulling removing its uh, outer layer they are Uh, steaming and cooking it, and they are expelling its oil. F the final product is oil, and the byproduct is sunflower cake. Then this sunflower cake is further used for any uh, end use which it is having, because every industry byproduct it goes to some kind of further industry for its usage. So similarly, presently uh, at Cipet we have worked on crops like soya bean, groundnut, 
uh, rice bran and in which uh, the uh, our main product is groundnut for example and after groundnut it went to the oil industry we got the groundnut oil which is coming in the market what is the left the left is a groundnut cake similarly in soy it is soya cake and in case of rice bran it is deoiled rice bran so these are some other cakes like soybean deoiled cake it looks like that groundnut deoiled cake sunflower deoiled cake rapeseed deoiled cake mustard cake is uh, majorly used in feed and uh, uh, the protein ext uh, protein which is extracted from it it have a cert certain kind of uh, uh, you can say uh, it tastes very different bitter in taste and as far as the soy and groundnut and bran rice bran protein is they are they are totally bland you can't find a difference between a powdered almond and a and their and the protein which is uh, coming from the groundnut soya bean and the rice so uh, then depending upon the type of product people are launching the industries are launching in market they have named these products accordingly and it's up to the consumers what exactly they want to take and accordingly their rates are decided there are such such certain products where we can say the protein and rest floor it could be named so when it is a protein content of 45 to 65 percent we say concentrate when it has a protein content of 66 to 85 percent and we say it's a isolate when it, it it has more than 86 or basically more than 90 percent protein content is there then we say the protein isolate so parallelly they they being uh, priced accordingly the floors are uh, quite cheaper and followed by the concentrates are uh, uh, have a higher high cost and isolates have the higher cost and uh, there are a few like uh, soy pro this is a soybean based protein and uh, what is the raw material the raw material in this case is the soybean cake and this soybean cake it is being used it is processed and then we take extract the protein out of it and after uh, this protein extraction it is being dried and then it is sold so this is soya pro so uh, the, these all are coming from the your residues but there is a there is one more thing that earlier uh, people are using uh, whole crops for making these kind of proteins now in, in last uh, this uh, 5 7 8 years now uh, the uh, people have researchers have concentrated on the residues part that how much uh, value we can add to that residue and how much protein could be extracted from these residues so now we are shifted from whole crop to the uh, production of protein from uh, uh, these kind of uh, cakes and and another example uh, is of the uh, brown rice protein uh, there are a few players if you could find them on amazon and uh, they are quite high priced like uh, uh, there are two things in case of rice, because of some certain extraction issues of the protein uh, protein they their uh, purity is usually 80 percent which is being marketed and uh, uh, there is a huge difference in their in their price if you could see that for one brand the 100 grams itself cost you 890 rupees uh, just imagine only 100 grams and in other 360 grams you're 750 uh, rupees and uh, in the third it is around 4000 yeah for 1 uh, kg they are charging you 1523 likewise and the difference is because of uh, either they are adding certain kind of supplements certain vitamin minerals to it or depending upon the purity or depending upon the uh, uh, yes purity again the prices they vary now if we talk about uh, uh, what we have done at icrc fit on for production of these plant proteins uh, i want to share that we are working in this area from for past uh, 8 9 years and uh, first we have worked on the soy protein isolate and groundnut protein isolate where we have developed a novel method of extraction uh, that is and uh, we we filed three patents in it one indian patent is being granted and two international patents uh, being filed and that uh, our technology is the microbial method for production of these isolate and concentrates from oil seed cakes these are our technologies which are being licensed and uh, uh, with their licensing fee and this technology uh, it's a novel technology i want to add one thing here that in india uh, we are the first one who have worked on such kind of area and uh, we come with this kind of technology and uh, in australia when we are filing our patent then we have checked in australia there is there is there is one firm one company which is making similar not exactly same similar kind of products and just in uh, this our technology it was commercialized first in 2020 
and uh, now in last two months tata has come with a product which, which is called as gofit and if you can check on uh, google then uh, it's a women centric uh, protein and where they are using similar kind of uh, uh, technology what we have uh, done in 2020 and uh, so uh, we could say that uh, icr and specifically our institute cifet they are working in such a novel area and other our technology that is also being commercialized is the technology for production of rice bran protein so here ultimately we are working on the residues on the byproducts part depending upon the concentration depending upon the amount of protein present in that it's not that randomly we'll pick any kind of residue and we'll start extracting certain kind of bioactives or certain kind of uh, protein in it no it should be there should be uh, an edge in the uh, in its uh, composition there should be like for example in soy and uh, soy we all know that uh, after extraction of oil the meal which is left it has around 50 uh, percent protein and that because it have a huge protein content in it that's why it is being exploited hugely around the world through standard methods and uh, Presently, China is the biggest supplier. Uh, likewise, everybody knows in every in every other thing, China is the largest supplier. So similarly, China is the largest supplier of that soy protein. What we are doing in India, people are exporting their soy meal at a very less price to them, and they are supplying that a uh, uh, costly soya protein to our country in form of different kind of products. But now, uh, with these efforts, we are trying in last four or five years that people should start their entrepreneurship. People should come to us. They should learn this novel area. Because now, if you see, if you observe, just, just check, just add protein supplements in market. The uh, Your uh, online surfing is flooded with these kind of products, which are coming from other countries then again the atman nirbhar bharat what are pmcs then we need to work on these areas also and we need to bring out certain which other have not done so uh, likewise we are working on these things now uh, till we have uh, i have uh, uh, shared you the protein products from animal residues secondly i have shared with you the protein products from plant residues now there is a third angle also which i want to share that is a protein uh, supplement from the microbial sources also. And they are also in the market. Uh, at CFED also, we have worked on certain kind of uh, microbial protein also. And if uh, just for uh, some could recollect that they might have seen such kind of uh, algae capsules. They are available on Amazon. Vega, uh, other brand is Vega. And if you could easily find the red star savory yeast flakes are there, like your corn flakes. These are yeast flakes. These are also protein rich how these kind of proteins could be used these tablets they are being consumed depending upon the uh, uh, as suggested by the doctor there are a few international companies like earthrise red star bp shell and there are indian companies also these are dabur himalaya and uh, others and they are making such kind of products which uh, which could be taken so what's the edge over uh, over the animal then over the plant is the production like for uh, for growing any plant at least uh, its whole life cycle takes three to six months and after three to six months the we we, we obtain the uh, uh, product for example cereal for example rice it took six months to grow and then after its milling we obtain the residue which we are uh, which we are trying to use that residue for protein production but the beauty in case of the microbial sources of protein is that you can grow it in lab in 24 hours you have your product in hand so and with incoming times we we have to we have to work in these areas because uh, we all know shortage of land there's a shortage of all kind of your sources it could be water it could be anything we need to be fast and up in on the production side and as i told that uh, we are deficit it in proteins then we need to work on certain things which are providing you a source of pro which are adding to your 10 grams of protein which you are taking the other uh, 40 grams is being added by such kind of safe supplements i could say and again, depending upon the uh, uh, suitability, people can opt for either the microbial sources of protein, either the your plant sources of protein, or uh, uh, the, the animal sources of protein. Because ultimately, all the three, they are coming from different kind of residues.
and beside that uh, there is a huge application part which theoretically i could say uh, being we have all studied when we talk about the waste byproducts and the residues and some of them i have applications some of them are commercially being produced in the industries few of the examples are here like uh, these residues used as single cell proteins they could be used for production of ethanol biofuels they being used for production of different enzymes for example presently we are using a uh, different kind of uh, uh, residue materials like bagasse and your straws and uh, other uh, uh, stocks we are we are we are working on these uh, these aspects presently at cifet and through solid state fermentation we are making different commercial enzymes also so likewise uh, pigments and your vitamins xanthan pulinin biogas there are many value added products that are coming from these residues they are the basic material is residue and through different kind of uh, micro bio processing different kind of uses of microbes and different kind of usage of enzymes they are being converted to these kind of value added products and uh, if if uh on a further side again if we, in a briefly i just uh, i'm just showing that how that these uh, straws peels cakes and uh, they through the fermentation as i told you microbial fermentation how they are uh, converted into the application parts like the fuels temp a product fermented product feed and your fertilizers different kind of chemicals and antibiotics so likewise there are many applications among which today uh, i briefed Uh, an overview about the proteins and the further physical form usage of different kind of residues now in conclusion we can say as i told you that we need to work on the sustainable bio conversion of the residues for their value addition which could be economical viable which could have an acceptability among the consumers and it should be sustainable in all terms and there are different forms where it could these residues being used it could be either in form of pellets it could be either in use form of mushroom cultivation and as a food it could be used for production of proteins and certain uh, residues are rich in dietary fibers that, that dietary fibers could be extracted and many more but ultimately uh, the conversion sh should be a sustainable bio conversion with its economical value and economical viability and parallelly what we are focusing on reducing the carbon footprint making the cheaper and alternate uh, viable sources viable alternate sources we can make at lab level but it should be viable commercially also and uh, we need to work on like in in one instance people will think that when we are getting everything from food then uh, why to uh, go for such kind of supplements and why to uh, target the residues when we have the main crop but for meeting the demands of as we all know that how our population is growing we need to work on the non conventional sources also because pulses in pulses india uh, india is uh, i can say it's on the niche side on production and and how to what percentage of population that pulses are reaching and what population is consuming or gen, and to whom it is being reaching how much they are consuming it daily and uh, likewise the milk and different sources from where we are getting the protein so we need to look we need to uh, look on these aspects also today do one thing go and check your bmi and just any app you download for example you can download healthy fi me any app you download and just uh, just for a sake of knowing that what kind of healthy food you are eating just for a sake of 2 3 days add your diet what breakfast you are taking what lunch snacks what you are taking just in 2 3 days you get an idea that what is your intake of carbs what is your intake of fat what is your intake of protein and fiber from that itself you got an idea that where you are lacking and accordingly you should act upon that just to avoid the medication which we later uh, get from the doctors but ultimately uh, we uh, ultimately the focus what what we are losing we are losing on the food part itself we are eating food we are eating lot of food but we are not eating balanced food so with this thank you very much thank you miss surya for such a nice and informative presentation Uh, it is pertinent in this scenario to deal with the agricultural waste management, and it uh, surely a upcoming researchable area as well as general awareness for the common people. So now the house is open for discussion. Dr. Pankaj, you have raised hand, so you may ask question, and some somebody else wants to ask, they may also.
Somebody wants to discuss something or some some feedback related to the session. Hello, no, madam. Madam, did you check the essential amino acid content uh, between these protein isolates from plant, animal, and uh, microbial? Yes, yes. Yes, we have checked. Like, for example, uh, in one slide where I have uh, shown you uh, the microbial method which we have developed. The the, uh, the protein which we are extracting using that microbial method, its amino acid, essential amino acid content is far better than the standard method which is being used in industry. When we are uh, working on proteins, then we are looking into all, not only the amino acid profiling, we are working uh, also on its functional properties, that how it could further behave. It should not be denatured. We are also looking on not only upon the protein uh, content up to pd cast level up to animal uh, trials we have gone and we found that it have many anti diabetic and many uh, good properties uh, uh, what we are making at uh, what we have technologies available at cfit okay madam madam what about protein digestibility madam protein yes digestibility. yes uh, very good question uh, i want to share one thing uh, uh, like the standard protein, for example, soya protein, which is available in market. Uh, as I told you, there are two. There is a difference. One is the protein isolate. One is the hydrolyzed protein. Hydrolyzed protein is that we all know that there are digestibility issues with the plant proteins. That specifically with the pea and the soy. So what uh, what the industries are doing? They are getting certain kind of digestible enzyme in it so that your body could adapt could easily digest it. On the other side, we are working on rice bran protein. Why? We are working on this protein because its digestibility is higher than casein and your egg protein. So in that case, you don't need to add any kind of enzymes or further supplements. It is as such because we all know rice is highly digestible. We are giving the, uh, if you could uh, see the labeling of Cerelec, it have the rice protein what we are giving to the newborn babies. So yes, when, when there is an issue of digestibility, people are using enzymes. What method we have, what technology we have developed at CFET, that itself is increasing its digestibility from 62% to 89%. OK, thank you, madam. One more question, madam. Like, uh, What is the essential amino acid profile in rice bran protein, madam? These are uh, basically, in rice bran, these are lysine rich. Like other okay. cereals, they they uh, their amino acid profiling, if you could see, they lack. Rest of the amino acids, they are at par, similar to other plant proteins, but these are lysine rich. Apart from that, they are anti diabetic and uh, they have uh, uh, high digestibility. And uh, their protein, you can see those people who are allergic to, uh, you can say, uh, soy and other things, they could easily uh, can start with the rice proteins because of its uh, uh, dig digestibility issues and also the PER ratio means how much protein is uh, available in your body after you consuming it. OK, thank you, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Yes, doctor. sir. Uh, uh, ma'am, uh, uh, really, I enjoyed your presentation. And you can clearly put a lot of effort uh, into it. Uh, one question I, I want to ask, what are the potential harmful effects of protein supplements? Uh, harmful effects you can say. See, uh, we know excess of everything is bad. This saying itself is true. Likewise, I told you that everyone should check their BMI. And accordingly, uh, like uh, people say, at least, at least more than 50%, you can take the protein. Only that much is required. If you are taking something in more, definitely you have certain blotting issues, your stomach aches, and other digest digestion issues. Otherwise, there are no such harms. Because they are pure proteins. Something is pure doesn't mean you take it 10 spoons a day. You have to be gradual. Like uh, we are eating chapati every day. Similarly, we are eating proteins every day. But these supplements are safe. They, 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 I cannot say even a supplement because they are not flooded with different kind of uh, additives. It is a pure protein thing that is being extracted from a residue or that is being extracted from a crop. And it is being uh, uh, just panned and uh, given to the consumer. That's it. OK, ma'am. And uh, uh, is there any age uh, 
uh, we can't uh, um, uh, there is no the age okay. no there is no age uh, uh, that's why i think uh, there are uh, around uh, how much participants 121 just do one thing just check your bmi for 3 days okay. download any app and just check what diet you are mm -hmm. taking for 3 days oh. Okay. And then you will realize that where you are lacking. We, that's why we are saying that our weight is not Out of 121, at least half will agree with this point. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Madam, may I add again, madam? Yeah. Thank you very much, madam, for your nice presentation. I have a small question, madam. Yes. Can you explain the importance of the glycemic index in fatty rice? And the diabetic patient, the which variety of uh, rice have to prefer? That glycemic uh, index. Glycemic yeah, glycemic index. glycemic index. I can say, but I cannot uh, uh, say uh, about the variety because uh, we are not working on the crop aspects. See, glycemic index is basically you can say uh, it's a value which is assigned to any kind of food based upon how quickly and how high these products can increase your blood glucose level. See, so for example, uh, if you talk about the oats, they have a low glycemic index. So people who are diabetic, they have to go for such kind of products like oats instead of rice because they have a high glycemic index. So likewise, uh, the varieties what people have developed, you have to contact those, the breeders. and. Parallelly, I can say that instead of fine cereals, instead of your uh, this uh, wheat or rice, you go for the poorest cereals like the millets. Like in this year, we are celebrating the millet year. So all those millets, they, they have low GI. The diabetic people can go for that. That diet is really good for the diabetic people. Okay, thank you, buddy. So instead of rice, uh, it is better to go. For even uh, even even uh, you can replace the rice with your quinoa. Quinoa okay. have a similar flavor uh, while making, and uh, uh, it's very rich in protein and dietary fibers with a low GI. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. G. Hello, madam. Uh, thank you for a nice presentation. Uh, I am a, a floriculture scientist uh, in Hyderabad. Uh, yeah. I have a doubt. Uh, can we uh, uh, prepare some um, cattle feed cakes using flour residues? like flour waste yes we can make see there is a basic requirement for feed if i'm not wrong uh, pragya may correct that uh, at least uh, uh, the bias have given certain guidelines it should be fall in that basically presently whatever residues we are generating from uh, producing these proteins that residue is being used for the animal feed i think and it should have 10 percent of protein and it's it, it insoluble ash is around one to two percent so yes feed could be prepared Okay. Yes. Hello. G. Madam, please tell me, sugar cane leaf can be used as a feed for milk cotton? Sorry, sir. Okay. Uh, your, I didn't got get your question. Please repeat. Yes, sir, I'm saying uh, sugar cane leaves. Sugar cane leaves. Can, can it be used for uh, as a feed? For milk cattle, for milk, you are okay. You are talking about the sugarcane leaves. See, every, every, uh, every uh, product, every residue, what is there? It could be used for, uh, for, uh, for feeding purpose. But the thing is that its composition is means it have a high lignin content. Although ruminants can can eat sugarcane leaves because they can easily digest the cellulose part of that which is but the cellulose part is quite high like 35 to 50 percent so yeah. in uh, not whole but a part of it can, could be used in mixing with the other kind of residues like straws and other green residues because all these residues they are adverse effect of uh, sugar cane leaves as on milk production capacity uh, i can't comment on that uh uh, she has. Uh, she is a, a plant scientist, actually, the agricultural scientist. So she is not specialized in uh, animal. Uh, but maybe if lignin is there, like when the paddy straw have some uh, deteriorating effect on milk production. Likewise, maybe. So it is a researchable area. 
can find in literature. So, yes, yes, Madam, I like the point. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Sir, you have a sugar cane leaf. Hello. Sir, you have a sugar cane leaf. Madam, I'm getting me. Your voice is, I mean, uh, there's some network issues. We're not getting your voice properly. Madam, I would like to add a point over there regarding the use of yes. sugarcane drops. Uh, yes. Sugarcane drops, it can be fed, no issue. But it should not be the hmm. only feed that it is fed. It, it should be fed with other like maize and uh, bajra or the nidir grass. Because if it is fed in the pregnancy period, so there are hmm. chances that due to phosphorus deficiency, there may be chance hmm. of post uh Hemoglobin area that is that is commonly seen because the sugar cane drop is less in phosphorus or it is phosphorus deficiency. So our uh, area is uh, predominantly sugar cane belt. So we regularly see that problem. So once the phosphorus is fed orally or injection is given, so immediately it recovers. Else there may be a chance of hemoglobin area or immaturity. So okay. Katishi, you got your answer, I think. Okay, okay, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So it is not advised as a sole food, but it can be fed as a fed as a part. But it is better okay. to avoid in late pregnancy. Okay, sir. Thank you. So is there any question? So if there is no question, we are going to end the session. Okay. So no more questions. So at the end, I would like to thank uh, Surya Madam for uh, coming to this uh, online training program and sharing her valuable insight in this upcoming researchable as well as the uh, need of the general public to know more about the protein and intake of protein in the form of supplements and other means. So thanks one again. Uh, once again, Surya and all the participants for joining us today. And we will again meet at 2.30. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.